So this is a great passage of scripture where the sea is parted and the people go through, and we know it so well. We often uh, hear about and refer to, and we were singing about it tonight, setting the captives free. We often speak that way, and it, it is something which is central to this ministry, setting the captives free to see the prisoners released. And I know that it's a theme which is close to the heart of so many people in this place. And if you think about it, that's the way it should be. It should be that we have these desires to see the prisoners released because it's a biblical teaching. It's what the Bible teaches. In the Psalm 14 and verse 7, it says, Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. Bring my soul out of prison, because I want to praise you, Lord. Release me. And in Psalm 53, verse 6, it says, When God bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, Israel shall be glad. And of course, the passage of scripture that is so precious to me, and, I'm, uh, and I know that it is to others who've had a, a word with me on it, Isaiah 61. And I'm going to read these verses. Because even just reading these verses thrills me so much. Verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Set the captives free. Release the prisoners. Of course, this is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke 4.18, Jesus quotes that passage to describe his ministry. So Jesus is about setting the captives free, releasing the prisoners. We want to see salvation, don't we? We want to see salvation here. Uh, folks coming uh, to this place and coming to Christ for the very first time, being brought to Jesus and entering into this freedom from sin, this, uh, the captives to sin, just the chains falling to the floor and they, and they move on into a brand new life for Christ. We want to see that here. However, my great desire, my heart's desire has always been not simply that that would take place, but that we would experience the bondage being broken. Whatever the chains are, that they would fall to the floor. It's always been my desire, it's always been the burden of my heart that whatever bondage has been keeping us from a full liberty in Christ would be broken and that we would be set free from that, that we would walk 
into freedom. Surely we would rejoice if people get saved from their sin and hallelujah. But wouldn't we also rejoice if Christians walk, get up and walked into the freedom that God has called them to? That the power of the, the Spirit of God would break the chains so that we would move in that direction, move in the direction that he is calling us into. And there's something to notice in this passage, something to notice here. As we begin to experience the freedom that God has for us, as we begin to walk into God's purposes, and we find those lessons here in this passage. The title of the message tonight is Enemy Pursuit and a Nighttime Crossing. Enemy pursuit and a nighttime crossing. You see, Israel had been freed from Egypt. Moses in verse 13 said to the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you see, or whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more. The Lord shall fight for you. You shall hold your peace. You see, they had moved away from Egypt. They were no longer in Egypt now. They were on the journey. They had been brought out. Of course, that's what Moses was told he would do. In Exodus 5 and verse 1 and elsewhere in Exodus, we hear the wonderful words of God, let my people go. Those are really beautiful words for the Christian to hear. Because you see, so often we find ourselves released but struggling. And the call of God comes, let my people go. Let them go. Let them go so that they can worship me. But when he was speaking to Pharaoh these words, he also engineered the freedom of the people of Israel. It wasn't simply that he said to Pharaoh, let my people go. He knew that Pharaoh wouldn't be too keen to do that. And so what God did was he organized it, he engineered it, and all the plagues fell upon the Egyptians in order to get Israel out of Egypt. As God's chosen instrument then, Moses was to was to lead the Israelites out of the land of their slavery, out of the, the land of their bondage. God said to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, he says, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses, the one chosen by God to deliver the people of God from the bondage that they were in. Through Moses, Pharaoh would hear the words, let my people go. There's a power in that when God says it. Let my people go. But you'll notice in our passage we find that Israel have been freed, but they're being pursued. In verse 5, in verse 5, it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. Here's a wee word to Pharaoh thousands of years later. It wasn't your idea. Why have we done this? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him, and they chased after Israel. 
We find that in these verses. Israel are, are, have been liberated. Moses has led them out of the, the, the land of slavery. And here comes the Egyptians after them. They've been redeemed by the king of heaven. Yet they're now hunted by the king of Egypt. And he seems to have them where he wants them. He seems to have them where he wants them, between his army and the ocean. In verse 10, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. This rebellious cry, they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in this wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us? to carry us forth out of Egypt. You see, this is the people of God. They've been set free. They've been led into freedom. And now they're moaning in their freedom. And they're moaning because they see the enemy coming for them. I don't know, but I felt like that. Have you ever felt like that where you know you're free? You know that, that you've been led into liberty. That spiritual Egypt, the land of your slavery, you no longer live there. You no longer live under the, the ruler of the king of Egypt. You no longer live under that old tyrant, the devil the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at work in, the, in those who are disobedient, you know that you don't live there anymore because Jesus Christ, God's chosen deliverer, has set you free. He's set you free at Calvary. But you lift up your head and you see signs of the enemy prowling around. You're free, but you're pursued. You better believe that. You see, as we want to walk into the future that God has for us, whether it be personally or corporately, we need to be understanding of that, that the enemy is after us because he wants to bring us back. And that's something we really need to recognize because, you see, it puts in context so much of our experience with temptation. Why are we being tempted? Why does the enemy seek to tempt us? Because he wants us back under his spell. He wants us back under his control. He wants us. And he wants to lure us. You see, he's pursuing. He knows we're gone. He knows as well as we do that Jesus has set us free. He knows the power of the blood of Christ. But he's banking on the fact that the people of God who have been set free, just like the Israelites, will panic when they see him. We're freed, but we're pursued. Your salvation's secure. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? When the enemy's having a wee bite, when he's having a nibble at you, when he's trying to bring you back, trying to reel you back in again, your salvation is secure. Your salvation is secure because, you see, God planned it. <laughs> God planned your salvation, God procured your salvation, and God applied your salvation. So the, the, the devil will chase, the devil will pursue, but he will, you're secure. 
you need to remember that you're secure because he wants you to see all the wee nibbles that he's having at you. He wants you to see the soldiers that he's sending after you. He wants you to look and see the chariots that are coming for you. And he wants you to forget that you've been led out of Egypt and you are now a free man and a free woman. He wants us to forget that we have been liberated. It's marvelous. You see, what happens is God actually, because of who we are in Christ, God has given us an awareness so that when the devil comes for us, when we get over that momentary panic that we, we wonder what's happening and we suddenly begin to realize with a clear thought, clear mind, the very fact that the devil is pursuing after us tells us what? We're free! It's just super. That old tyrant he just confirms what God has done for us. Anyway, the people of Israel have been set free, but the enemy was after them. And when we lift up our eyes, we see the old lion, don't we? We see at times the, the roaring lion prowling around, looking for someone to devour. That's what Peter tells us. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5 and verse 8. Or maybe you stepped out for God. Maybe you stepped out for God or you're on the verge of doing so. And the enemy sends his hounds after you. You know the hounds I'm talking about. The hounds of worry. The hounds of doubt. The hounds of fear. You suddenly see that they're in hot pursuit. And that thing that God told you to do that excited you so much, suddenly you're thinking, oh no. How are we going to manage this? How are we going to manage that? What's going to be the case here? What's going to be the case there? And, and you begin to doubt, did I really hear God? Or is that just me that's, that's reading things into it? Did I really hear him or am I just making it up? Uh, is it just something that I really want and I'm saying that it was God? And, and all of these things the devil throws at us, all of these things. He wants to stop us. But you and I need to be encouraged. And if you're sitting here tonight and this is you, you need to be encouraged, you see, because one thing I can guarantee you, you will not be taken back into captivity. You will not be taken back. He cannot have you. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ has freed you so completely that the devil cannot lay his hands on you anymore and bring you back into the fold. It will not happen. God will not allow it. You see, we need to listen to what Moses is saying in verse 13. Moses says to the people, fear ye not. Fear ye not. The Egyptians are, the Egyptians are teeming after them. Fear ye not. The ocean is behind them. Where are we going? What's happening? Moses says, fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. The Egyptians whom you have seen today, you'll see them again no more. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Isn't that marvelous? Here they are with the Egyptians coming to their face, and behind them is the, is the sea. Where do they go from here? Moses says, fear not, stand still, and see what God will do. 
see what God will do. See the deliverance that God will bring about. But they weren't simply to stand still and fear not. Look what God says to Moses. God says to Moses in verse 15, Wherefore criest thou unto me? So obviously we have the Egyptians chasing them. They've got the sea behind them. What did they do? Oh, they prayed. Moses prayed on their behalf. Lord, what are we going to do? What's happening here? How do we get through this, Lord? You can picture the kinds of prayers that Moses would, would send up to God. And look what God says. Why are you crying unto me? Speak to the people of Israel or the children of Israel that they go forward. Where? Can't go that way because the Egyptians are there. Can't go that way because the sea's there. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to go forward. Tell them to move on out. You see, God was on the verge of doing something absolutely marvelous. Totally unbelievable if it wasn't in the scripture. The people were to stand firm, trust God, and then move into what God was about to do. But here's the thing. They had to be prepared to move out before anything happened. The sea was still there. God said to Moses, tell them to move towards the sea. <laughs> That's the way forward. The way back is to Egypt. You're not going there. You're going forward to the promised land. But you need to move while the sea is still there. Is that not amazing? And it's when they move, it's when they're prepared to move, it's when that message is given to the people that God says, lift up thou thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it, that the children go through on dry land. But you see, that heart had to be right, that heart had to be ready to go. Are you ready to go? You see, there's a future for every one of us. There's a personal future for every single one of us tonight. And the devil's chasing you. And the sea's behind you. You turn and you see the enemy. You turn and you see the water. And you think, my goodness me. And God says, move forward. Move forward. Because when you move, when you're ready to move, when you're prepared to move, I will open the way. Folks, that's for us. We've got a God who says exactly that to us tonight. Your life, it may be challenged at the moment by something. God says, move on into it. <laughs> oh, dearie me. It's like, he did the same with the river, with Joshua. The river was still flooded, flooding. It was still a torrent. And he told the priests to put their feet in the water. And it wasn't until they put their feet in the water that the water opened. God always intended to open the river. God always intended to part the sea. Always intended it. But he wanted his people to show that they are willing to move on even when they think there's nowhere to go. Oh, brother or sister, you need to be encouraged by that tonight because I know there must be some someone or people here tonight who are in a situation that they can't see how they go because it's just a blockage. God says, well, if you prepare and move, move in your heart, watch what I will do. The people in Joshua's day physically moved, stood in the water. But you see, the strange thing is, it's when your heart is convinced that God will do something. 
when your heart is convinced that what God is saying to you is going to happen, that's when you're convinced of it, the way is opened up. And I stand here as a witness to that fact. And I know there are others in the congregation who are witnesses. We all should be witnesses to that. God made that way. We need to move out into the great thing that God has planned for us. Pursued we may well be. But those who have been freed by Jesus are really free. Is that not what the Savior teaches us? Those whom the Son sets free are free indeed. Are you under siege? Maybe you are. Then the word of God says tonight, stand firm. Stand your ground. Are you afraid of going forward? The word of God tonight says, tell the people to move out. Move on. Move forward. Even when you can't see how, you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you. Verse 13 is amazing. Fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. You see, it's already planned. It's already in the heart of God. God is relating his heart through Moses. God is not saying, tell the people to move on and I will think of something. No, God has it already in his heart. He says to Moses, fear not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which uh, he'll show you today. He's got it all sorted. What a wonderful God we serve tonight. I want to tell you, brother or sister, the Lord has it sorted for you. Oh, pastor. Don't, oh, pastor. The Lord has it sorted for every single one of us. You don't know the depths of my situation. No, I don't. But the Lord knows the depths of your situation. And the Lord says, fear not. Stand still. In other words, trust me. And I'll show you. I'll show you how I'll open the ocean. Move on. But there's something beautiful in that verse 13. God says, The Egyptians whom ye have seen today, in other words, those who trouble you that you've seen today, those who are after you that you've seen today, You shall see them again no more forever. Is that not amazing? When you cross over into what God has for you, those things that the devil has sent to stop you, those doubts that the devil has put upon you, those fears that you and worries that fill your heart and mind as you seek to step out for God, as you seek to move forward for God, when you move into the plan and purpose of God through that parted ocean. It will close over these Egyptians and you will not see them again. God will take care of it. If you walk into his plan and purpose, the thing that's trying to stop you right now, that will be gone. The thing that the devil wants to use to put the barrier up, that will be gone. So the Israel, Israelites have been freed and they're being pursued. But it's not simply that they're freed and being pursued. Even in the pursuit, even in the chase, God gives them great assurance and protection. In verse 19, 
The angel horse is beautiful. The angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. It came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israelites. That's delicious. Because you see, the assurance is this. The cloud moved from before them to behind them. The assurance is this. The cloud had been guiding them to that point. The cloud had been before them to that point. In other words, it doesn't matter that Pharaoh is now chasing after them, trying to get them back. It doesn't matter about their doubts and their fears and their worries. None of that means that they're on the wrong path or they've taken the wrong road because the cloud had been before them all the way. God had led them to that point. Isn't that a great assurance? That should assure us, folks, tonight, because, you see, there are times when we find ourselves challenged by what the enemy is wanting to do, and, and, and we wonder, have I got it right, as I just said earlier? Is this the right path for me? Are we on the right road as a church? Well, the fact of the matter is, the Lord has led us this far, aware of it all, aware of the enemy pursuit, aware that behind us there is the ocean and we don't, know how to, we don't know how to get over. That's okay. That's okay because the cloud has led us. The glory of God has led us this far and now the glory of God goes round behind them. He moves from guiding them to going behind them to protect them. How marvelous. So let me say that again. Maybe you're at the, maybe you're at the dead end, so you feel. Well, firstly, God has led you there. Secondly, God has moved around behind you. God is now protecting you until that opens up. Marvelous. That's our God. He's standing behind you to protect you. He's saying, in a sense, by doing this, he's saying to Pharaoh, these are my people. Folks, you are his people. Devil can't have you, regardless of what he tries. These are my people. God had led them out. Now he's protecting them. He stands in the gap. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them. But you see, here we are tonight, and we know the name of that cloud that led the people. His name is Jesus. Jesus Christ led his people to that point. Jesus Christ went behind them to protect them. Our Jesus, our Savior. Are you worried about your future, about what God wants of you? How great it is to hear that Jesus Christ is protecting you. He has your back. Are you pursued? Yeah. Are you standing firm? Well, we're trying to. Are you protected? Absolutely. 
What about the beautiful verses in Acts chapter 9? When you've got the Apostle Paul. I don't know whether he was on a horse or not. I, I doubt it. But I like to think of him getting knocked off his horse as Jesus stands in front of him. Anyway, he was knocked to the ground, wasn't he? Jesus says in verse 4, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Beautiful. And then he says, Paul says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled. Trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and I, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So Jesus is saying to Paul, you're persecuting me, Paul, and we know that Paul was persecuting the church. And so what we know also is that Jesus is identifying so closely with the church that when the church are persecuted, Jesus takes it as a personal slight. And he stands between the church and Paul, who was coming to destroy the church, who was coming to wreak havoc and Jesus stands between them and him. Protecting his people. We thank God tonight that Jesus still says, these are my people and you're not getting them. He or she is mine. Get your hands off. I love that. This is my Savior. This is my Lord and Savior. It's your Lord and Savior. He is the one who redeemed us and brought us out of spiritual Israel by the cross. And he has guided us all the way to this point. And he now comes to us and says, I'll protect you until the way opens up for you. Church, we need to be thrilled at that. Thrilled at that. You'll notice as well that when this cloud went behind the people of Israel, it caused darkness for the Egyptians. And it gave light to the Hebrews. My word. Verse 20. Came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of, the, of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, that's the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to these, that's the Israelites, so that no one came near, not, they didn't come near each other all night long. The Egyptians couldn't see. The cloud made it dark. So the enemy's after you. The Lord has gone behind to protect you. To such a degree that at the moment before it opens, the enemy's confused. But the Shekinah glory was shining for the people of God. It was bright for them. Are you glad about that? That the, the light shines for us, shining brightly. Assuring the people of Israel, I've got you and I'm about to lead you forward. And the Egyptians were in all sorts of disarray. So we need to take courage at that. We need to take courage that even as we wait for God to act on our behalf, He's protecting us until the sea opens up. So in the midst of the chase, 
you need to know and I need to know. We need to know that the Shekinah glory still shines for us. Shines for you too. Final point though. We know that the Lord parted the sea and his people crossed over on dry land in verse 22, we're told that. We know that this crossing would eventually lead them into the fullness of that freedom that God was leading them to. And so whether we're grappling with sin or whether we're grappling with a decision that God wants us to make about our future, When you cross, you will cross on dry land. The obstacles will be taken care of. You will be able to see. The the ground will not be treacherous when you begin to go. But it's the timing of the crossing that I wanted to emphasize. Verse 21 says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Verse 24, And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the Egyptians. In the morning watch, he looked to the Egyptians who were now pursuing into the water. Israel had already crossed over. Look at verse 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared. Israel crossed over at night when it was dark. How could they do that? Because the light of God was shining. But it was dark. It was a nighttime crossing. He opened the sea in the middle of the night. At the darkest moment of the night, And just like unbelief doesn't change the truth, darkness doesn't change the plan of God. And so maybe you're sitting in darkness, maybe you're struggling with it. Ah, but look to God, you see, because God's light is still shining and God's going to lead you through the water. God's going to open the ocean and lead you through when all is dark around you, when everyone else can't see. When you're panicking at that deepest, darkest moment, then God's opening up the sea for you to walk over on dry land. We need to be rejoicing at that tonight. We need to be the kind of people who say, our God can do it. We need to be the kind of people who say, even darkness is light unto God. His light breaks every dark moment. After all, at the moment of your um, darkest night, at that moment, your darkest spiritual night, when Satan was making a great play for you, At that very moment, what happened? The death of Jesus Christ tore the curtain in two so that the glory of God would shine through and we could walk into it. Isn't that amazing? At the moment of our darkest, deepest need, Christ's death ripped the curtain apart, and the glory flooded in. And we walked into glory. In Luke chapter 23. 
Luke 23 and verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Even at noonday, it was deep dark. Even when the sun was shining, it was blacked out. A deep darkness over everything until the curtain was torn, hallelujah. Until the curtain was torn, and in comes the glory. In comes the glory of God. This is the reality for us. We need to be comforted by that too, that the plans of God for us are not hampered by nighttime. They're not hampered when it's dark. Oh, no, not at all. We need to be able to rejoice that when Jesus is standing with us, nighttime isn't so menacing. When the light of the world is standing with us, nighttime isn't so menacing. We can walk by his light. He will lead us. He will lead us. We need to be comforted with the reality that, that um, darkness cannot overcome the light of Jesus Christ. Cannot overcome that light. He says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Even though it's dark, you'll not find it dark. You'll see. Can you get that? When the light of God shines, you will see the way. And he'll lead you through the way. Don't give up hope. Don't uh, think that nighttime is a problem. Spiritual nighttime is not a problem. Nighttime is the time of crossing over. Oh Lord, help us to cross over. That's when the the glory shines its brightest. So if your situation is like that, in some way, whether it be sin or whether it be moving on with Christ, then all you need to do is watch. All you need to do is watch. Jesus is about to do something marvelous. I believe that for my own life. I believe that for this fellowship. He's about to open the way and lead us through into the fullness of his purposes and blessings. We may be pursued, but there's a nighttime crossing on the way. I believe it. Mr. Bell believes it. Praise God. He believes it. Father, we come before you again tonight to thank you for our, our day to day, to thank you for our uh, experience of, of God with us. If there are any here tonight, Lord God, who are resisting your hand and resisting your move for them, Lord, would this be the night that you show them the way forward, that you show them the sea parting. Oh God, would you just give them a glimpse that they may walk out into what you have for them. If there are any struggling with sin in the building tonight, Lord God, then would you just do the same, open that way by showing them what Christ accomplished and may the glory of God shine so brightly in the hearts of your people. Father, how we love you. May we go forward with you. In Jesus' name, amen.